All right, let's jump in. Good morning. Welcome to the February 1st, 2024 Community Corrections Partnership. Uh, I'd like to open the meeting and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning. Member Benson? Here. Member Sullivan? Member Brookins? Member Geller? Member Lutz? Member Gordon? Member Donnelly? Here. Member Kathari? Here. Member Lester? Here. Member Jones? Here. Member Triplett? Here. Member Walker? Here. And Chair Yarber? Here. And then we do have one member participating remotely due to Just Cause, so we do need to take a vote to make sure that you guys do allow him to participate remotely. Got it. Excellent. Uh, let's move. Do we need to take that vote now? I'm sorry. So do we need a motion? Is that what I hear you gently uh, suggesting? I would, I would move to allow him to attend remotely. Excellent. Thank you. I'll we second have a first. It. We have a second. Please vote. We have to do roll call vote. Roll call vote. Excellent. Member Benson? Yes. Member Donnelly? Yes. Member Kathari? Yes. Member Lester? Yes. Member Jones? Yes. Member Triplett? Yes. Member Walker? Yes. And yes. Chair Yarber? Yes. Okay. And the motion passes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Moving right along. Uh, would like to ask Chief Lester to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. All right, clerk, would you please read the Metro Cable 14 opening statement and the meeting announcement? This meeting of the Sacramento County Community Corrections Partnership is being cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be replayed on Sunday, February 4th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at youtube.com slash metrocable14. To make a public comment in person, please fill out a speaker request form and hand it to clerk staff. The chairperson will open public comments for each agenda item or call for off agenda matters. When the chairperson calls your name, go to the podium and make your public comment. To make a public comment by phone, dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Clerk staff will transfer each caller into the meeting. You may be on hold for up to an extended period of time and your patience is appreciated. You may send written comments by email to boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Your comment will be routed to the members and filed in the record. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding of the meeting procedures. Great, thank you. Uh, we all open up to see if there are any opening comments from any of the members present today. I don't see anyone in the queue. Uh, just one advisement, I think, as it relates to perhaps our future meetings and the meeting today relative to uh, public comment via telephone in that we uh, typically follow suit with the board's directives and the way they organize and proceed with their meetings and, and the, of course, uh, invitation to public comment. Uh, today, since it was noticed, we will accept public comment via telephone, but going forward, I believe that will uh, cease to occur. We will only take comment in person and in writing. Uh, is my understanding. All right, uh, moving right along. Uh, Clerk, would you please read item one into the record if you're ready. Yes, item one is discussion and possible approval of 2024 Community Corrections Partnership meeting schedule. Great, and welcome and good morning to uh, our trustee analyst, Laura Foster. Uh, would you please lead us through the item? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to be with you all today. Uh, this item is short and sweet. Uh, normally, we would do this at our December meeting, but we didn't meet this December, so we're asking you to approve our meeting schedule for the year. Um, we'd like to be consistent with our current practice, which is to be on the first Thursday of the month on every even-numbered month. Um, however, this year, we do have a conflict in June due to the budget hearings happening at the same time. Um, so we are going to be looking for an alternate meeting for that date. Um, there's nothing available in June that wouldn't have a conflict with most of the members' schedules. So we would be looking to for you today to approve the schedule as is with no June meeting and then allowing me to work with our chair to find a meeting in either May or in July that would um, compensate for that June meeting. 
that's what I'm looking for today. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. Any uh, comments from our members? Uh, let's please open up any public comment relative to the item. We have no public comment. All right. Uh, if that's the case, then I will entertain a, a motion, perhaps. I'll make a motion to approve the calendar. Excellent. We have a first. Do we have a second? I'll second it. And a second. Do you need voice vote as well or roll call? Yeah. Please proceed. Thank you. Member Benson? Yes. Member Donnelly? Yes. Member Cathari? Yes. Member Lester? Yes. Member Jones? Aye. Member Triplett? Yes. Member Walker? Yes. And Chair Yarber? Yes. And the motion carries with those members present. Great, thank you. Look forward to getting something on all of your calendars, the joy. All right, uh, moving right along, item number two. Uh, clerk, please read item two into the record for us. Item two is Board of State and Community Corrections Annual Survey Submission Review. Great, and back to you, Laura. Hi, everyone. As uh, is well noted, every year we have to submit our annual AB 109 update. Um, we do that by December 15th of each year to the Board of State and Community Corrections. Um, it's a requirement in order to continue to receive funding. In addition to that, we also submit an annual survey. This survey is public, has always been posted on the BSCC's website, um, but we've never really brought it back to this forum just as a, another way of bringing transparency to this issue. The survey is a way of looking back. Our plan is a way of looking forward. So both of of those items are submitted each year. Um, I won't go over the survey in detail. It is in your packets today, but I did want to call out a couple of things that are re particularly relevant to the year ahead. Uh, there are questions in that survey that talk about our ability to achieve our goals and objectives, and that's a big driver of why this year we're really looking hard at our overarching goals and trying to develop some smart objectives um, so that we can better measure our progress on each of those goals. Um, additionally, some of the items ask about whether we use program and service evaluations to determine whether things should continue receiving funding, and that was a new um, add in our last AB 109 plan update is to develop an annual evaluation that would be standard and submitted, so that's a work in progress right now. Um, another one that's uh, just something that's interesting. So I, when I was coming into this seat, I was really building off of what was done in the past on each of these surveys. And for some of them, it was hard for me to go, well, how exactly did we find this answer? And so I want to be able to better answer those questions with a, a high degree of confidence. And so one of the questions looks at evidence-based programming and what portion of our services and the things that are funded through AB 109 dollars are done with evidence-based programming. And it does allow you to define that locally. So I think we could better answer that question if in our AB 109 plan this year, for each of our eligible items, we say, and here's the evidence base for it, if there is one, and if there isn't one, that we're able to then know that going into it so that I can calculate it at the end of the year what the percentage is. Um, additionally, there are a couple of opportunities where we get to really highlight programs um, or things that have happened over this past year or uh, year or so uh, that have been really positive. This year, we called out a couple different things. One of them was really looking at our work in mental health diversion, which is also a challenge for this county, but we've also made tremendous progress, particularly there's a, a work group that is a, a collaborative work group that has really worked to cut down the assessment process, and that's been a really positive change. Um, we also highlighted the development of probation's new mental health unit. That's a recent development, as well as over at RCCC, their Redemption Coffee program, a vocational reentry program, and that's shown really positive early results. Um, finally, there is a portion of this survey that asks us about the financial um, allocations. And the way, as most of you know here, is that when things are funded, they go to a department, and then that department uses it to, in many times, serve uh, CBOs and other organizations. But in terms of where our budget numbers go, it just looks like it goes to the sheriff, or goes to probation, or goes to one of these things. So that's what we're reporting on right now, even though we know that CBOs are ultimately receiving funding. So that's why in our last AB 109 plan update, we asked for um, some new reporting requirements every quarter when people submit their invoice that they tell us, hey, how much of this went to CBOs and what did it go for? So that way we can better show in this table what is also going to CBOs. Because otherwise we do continue to hear from the public, as it shows, CBOs aren't getting funding. It's like, no, we know they are. We're just not going that extra step in reporting just yet. So that's going to be an opportunity with some of the changes we've made moving forward. And that covers our survey.
Great, thank you. Any comments or questions from the members? I do have one question. Um, on CBO funding, um, with that expanded reporting, will we be able to know which CBOs are being funded to what amount and even the scope of work that they're being asked to you know, perform? Sure. What we will be receiving um, on a quarterly basis is going to say uh, the name of the CBO which category of service it falls into. So we have a series of, of eligible service categories and then how much was given to them. So we won't have a full explanation of the services provided, but each of our departments would be able to provide that if asked. Great, and will that be made public or published? Yes. Thank you. So once uh, we're only gonna begin starting officially that collection in July, so we're still gonna be a year behind on next year's survey, but by the time we get two years from now, <laughs> we're gonna have all that information, and we may even um, uh, sort of as a, um, we'll ask as a courtesy if our departments would provide us that sooner, um, but understanding that's not officially in our plan until July of 2024. So. Member Triplett. Uh, thank you. For any assessment or finding on what's working as far as what's evidence-based, is there going to be any analysis to look at recidivism rates uh, that's going to factor into helping us decide what is working, what's not working? I would say it's probably too early to make any declarative statement that that will be used as a factor. I think it will be definitely something that we are going to be tracking that's going to be part of the annual evaluations is looking at recidivism rates countywide, but also looking at specific programs if they have them. Some programs are so new it takes three years to even have a recidivism data. Um, but that's why we want to look at recidivism data and return to custody data. So it's going to be an ask from some of the programs who aren't currently tracking that to track that um, so that it can be a factor when we look at the evaluation and say, is this working? It's not going to be a, um, anything that says the recidivism rate is below this, no funding. I don't anticipate it going to that level because there's a lot of things that play into a particular year, why something looks the way it does, but it definitely will be a start of a conversation that will be critical to seeing whether something continues to be funded um, or is eligible for funding in the future. Other questions or comments? Uh, Clerk, do we have any public comment for this item? I do not see anyone in chambers other than uh, Member White, I believe, from SCOE. We have no public comments. No public. Do I need to open and close, or can we move forward? Let's please move forward then. Thank you uh, for the item, Laura. All right. Uh, on to item three on our agenda. Clerk, please read the item into the record. Item three is fiscal year 2024-25 AB 109 budget planning. Great, and back to you, Ms. Foster. All right, thank you. Uh, this is really a quick, quick update on just where we are in planning for the next budget cycle. Um, there's a number of things that go into looking at how we do our AB 109 allocations. Um, part of what we started doing last year was um, I wouldn't say correcting a historical wrong, but changing a practice to be something that's more in line with what we want to do going forward. Um, in the past, many years ago, uh, things were done, allocations were done on a percentage basis to departments who then had to identify the programs and services that would support those things that were eligible within the plan. Um, beginning last year, we asked departments, uh, really it's the Deputy County Executive Jones who has budget authority, he doesn't have budget authority, but he has budget um, input into the process. Ultimately, the board has budget authority, um, but he and his team are instrumental in recommending uh, AB109 allocations and proposing that for the budget in each year. Uh, so looking at what we're changing is last year we started the process of saying, hey departments who receive your AB109 funding, please tell us just to continue at that, those services that are eligible now and are funded now, to continue those services next year, what would it cost? So any uh, planned increases to personnel costs, any um, known contract increases that were related to the services being currently provided at the same level. So that is the, the baseline where we start. So we say, hey, what's it cost to continue doing what you're doing now? Um, because otherwise the county has to find an alternate funding source for those things. And because we can't uh, supplant in this county, we can't do wholesale changes um, and start funding using AB 109 to fund existing funding services that are using the general fund. So that's where we start. And we start with that recognizing that as we move forward, I think it's pretty well known at this point that revenue projections for the state looking a bit bleak. And so we can expect to see our growth growing at a smaller rate, uh, which at some point could outpace the current demand for services or the ability to sustain the funding that we do have, the services that are funded now. 
Um, so after that is done, we ask our departments and we say, hey, tell us what it costs to keep doing what you're doing at the same level you're doing it. And then the remaining funding is then eligible for growth requests. Um, those, when submitting growth requests, agencies and departments are asked to identify the uh, category, the L, um, letter and number of the eligible service that they'd like to use. There's really strong encouragement to use uh, growth requests for things that are one-time costs so that it diminishes the county's continued um, obligation. So if you take on new staff, then we have to continue to use this funding for those staff, and that funding source may not ultimately be available in future years. There is some reserve, again, highlighting those one-time projects, um, or say if you have things that are currently funded by a grant, that that grant's going away, this would be a great opportunity for those. Um, so just being thoughtful about how you're making your growth requests, recognizing we're not the county won't be able to find every growth request that's out there and may not be able to do it with AB 109, but to do it so that we can make the best use of that funding while still being true to the service, eligible services um, that were outlined in the plan. That's all right. That was a lot of information, but just wanted to just let everyone know that we have made that ask to the department say, hey, please give us where you're currently at so that the Office of the County Executive and the Budget and Debt Management team can build that budget once those growth requests comes in and make right decisions um, to present to the board. Thank you. So important. Uh, I will just underscore as well, um, given what I think is projected with regards to the economy uh, and the limited growth here with AB 109, and, and what I also know are... Uh, ideas and strategies also kind of in the queue, if you will, I think as suggested from our advisory board, uh, important that we continue to pay attention to this. So we'll be asking everyone to take a hard look at uh, existing needs. Uh, let me open it up though. Any comments or questions from the members? Uh, Chief Lester. I just have a question on um, the allocations. How are those decisions made? Is that local to um, the department that's receiving the funding or is there and I apologize for my ignorance on this, or is there a broader discussion? Uh, so ultimately the board makes the allocation that goes to the department. Um, currently with the strategy that's being employed at the moment, departments are only allowed to continue funding those same services that are funded now. Um, they're not they don't necessarily have the authority to just start funding other things that are eligible. Uh, however, that process every year with growth requests are submitted and they can say, hey, we'd like to also add this service. And then that becomes part of the existing um, package of services each year. With hopefully, again, highlighting one-time use things so that those don't continue to be obligations for the county. Thank you. And Laura, remind me, uh, only because I, I think I just did this presentation not long ago, but is it still the threshold of a four-fifths vote of the board to reject the recommendations from this body? Correct. So we have the AB 109 plan every year that comes in. Um, you approve it in October, and then it goes to the board in November. And the plan is approved unless it is rejected by four-fifths of the board. However, the plan does not have any specific funding things in it. It just says what what types of things can money Correct. can be spent on. And this past year, we did add in some. Uh, we're trying to kind of drill down that saying, hey, just because a, a phrase sounds good, you can't mm -hmm. just apply that to everything. There's some specifics and what that means for that what the plan means and what it allows, and only certain departments can even um, have eligible expenses in certain categories, so we're kind of tightening down on that um, so that more departments can participate and use AB 109 funding, that's the hope, and so that ultimately we can hopefully fund something in all of those service categories that are currently there, even though currently our funding sources does not cover all of the eligible services. No, great context, thank you. Other questions? I see none. Clerk, do we have any public comment relative? We have to no public comment. All right. Well, this also is uh, an informational item. Uh, and with that, let's move forward to item number four. Would you please read item four into the record for us? Item four is discussion and possible approval of work plan for the AB 109 2024 update. Great. Thank you. I think this item does require some action. Uh, to you, Laura, please. Uh, thank you. So one thing we started last year was developing a work plan, um, recognizing that we have those really hard deadlines for the CCP and CCPAB every year of producing this plan and getting it approved, um, that we really see that as a, a term we use in EOCs, as our, we set our battle rhythm. So that's what this work plan does for us, is, is we um, look at how we're going to get where we're going, <laughs> and we, we set the strategy for how to get there, and set timelines and targets for how we're going to achieve that. Um, it's much easier for us to get where we're going um, if we're on the same page in that direction. 
so this is a work plan. The work plan is a, designed to be a living document. So um, I, I tend to make changes based on something happens that moves things around, that that's OK. The, uh, but it's just kind of here's the st overall structure of how we're going to get where we're going. Um, a couple of the things that this work plan addresses are things that were in our in our AB109 plan. We had a section called future planning priorities. And we recognized up front that we called it future planning priorities because it couldn't all be done in one year. We didn't say next year's plan. Um, but we did address almost all of the items um, will be at least talked about in this year's work plan. Um, some of those most important ones are looking at a definition of community <coughs> safety, uh, developing those specific, measurable, achievable, and relevant and time-bound um, objectives for our overarching goals, um, implementing that program evaluation that we discussed, um, looking at implementing information from the jail population reduction plans, continuing to have a data focus, and then there were two topics that um, have now become ad hoc committees from the CCPAB, and that is to elevate the voices of crime survivors and family members in the planning process. So that's expanding the outreach that was done last year to the justice-involved population and recognizing that it's not just the individual, it's other people who are impacted by this as well. So really wanting to bring in victim voices and um, or survivors voices and uh, family members. A second ad hoc committee is going to look at racial disparities within the AB 109 population and those programs served by AB 109. That's not saying that there are. We're currently studying them. Um, but to bring that back to the group here. So that's work that's just being started. And um, the goal of that is potentially if it is seen that we have um, drastic disparities or that perhaps some of our programs that are being served are either um, yeah, not aligned with the same disparities that might be in the overall justice system, uh, that that could be something incorporated into a future iteration of the AB 109 plan that says, hey, this is an area of importance that um, when things are funded, that's also something we look at, which is how would this impact racial disparities for this county. Uh, so that's just some of the work that's being done that's outlined in this work plan. So um, one thing that I did want to call out is this work plan also includes many pieces that show and reflect how important it is to us receive community input on this plan throughout the process. There are, of course, um, meetings from the CCPAB and the CCP where members of the public can comment, but there are also specific windows of time and specific opportunities for public input that are called out here as well. Um, for example, we last just like last year, we posted our AB 109 plan online. We had about a month where we could receive public comments and writing. Um, in addition, last year we held a special workshop from the CCPAB. It was an evening meeting um, that over provided an overview of the draft plan and an opportunity for people to comment. Um, it was very poorly attended despite some advertisement last year. And so one change that was made this year is to not have that as a separate meeting, but to take one of the CCPAB's regular meetings and just give that as the focus. Um, while we recognize that some people have schedules that don't align with the CCPAB's meeting hours, um, it was determined that it wasn't a, suffi a sufficient number of participants from outside those hours to create that same obligation this year. Um, so with that, I have our draft work planned for you, understanding it will probably change, but I'm um, looking for the, CCP, the CCP's support with the direction that we're going, and so we have these markers um, that the community can rely on and look to us to bring some information back and have it in a very public way. Any additional information as it relates to the timelines, if you will, and milestones? Uh, nothing specific. Anything it's all, we should, we it's should be paying attention to, I should say. Um, I would say that just looking, the reason why, like, for example, we're not just going to cancel our June meeting, because if you look at what this group needs to do in mm -hmm. June, those are some pretty critical things for getting out that draft plan. Um, some of those big highlights would be looking at uh, those definitions. Get that definition for community safety, something that can be approved by this body. Those objectives, getting that approved by this body, because those are really going to drive the future of the plan and how we measure ourselves as we move forward. I think those are probably the big ones for this year. Great. Thank you for highlighting that. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions or comments from the membership? I see uh, first... Uh, Mr. Member Triplett, and I think Mr. Jones next. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that information, Ms. Foster. So looking at the uh, December 2023, the advisory board was tasked with discussing and establishing the ad hoc committees. 
Have those committees been formed yet? And, and if so, what was the selection process like for the committee members? Sure. Um, yes, those committees have been formed. Uh, current and basically, it was based on a volunteer basis. We said, "Hey, who is interested in serving?" Um, this was all done at the dais and in, in the CCPB, so all done publicly. Um, and each member was given an opportunity to put in for a committee, recognizing that they would probably only get to be on one committee. We do have 11 members of the CCPAB, and so our our limit for quorums would be five. Um, so no more than that number of participants on a committee. Otherwise, we would have to publicize those committees in accordance with the, the Brown Act. Um, so members were given an opportunity to do that. Currently, the membership for the racial disparities ad hoc includes um, two members from the public, as or two com community members, not members from the public, but community members from the board, um, as well as a representative from the court and a representative from the sheriff's office. On the second committee, which is our um, outreach committee that are to the crime survivors and families. That includes uh, two community members, uh, our social services representative, and the public defender's representative. So there is still a seat available on each of those if one of the members would like to join. Um, so we'll be reminding them at our next meeting in February if additional members, um, you know, some of our departments who are not represented on a committee yet would like to participate, that we can do that. Thank you. Great. Uh, I believe I recognize Member Joan next and then Member Katari, please. Thanks. So you mentioned that the CCPAB will be working on a, a definition, if that's the right term, of community safety. Correct. And so uh, I do believe the Public Safety and Justice Advisory Committee is going to also perhaps assist um, with CCPAB in at least input on what that safety means to, uh, to our community. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's very important to the CCPAB that they don't create this definition in a vacuum. They recognize there's only four community members who sit on that board, and therefore they do not represent the whole community. Um, so we are really encouraging members of the public. We've done that through the, the Public Safety and Justice Agency Advisory Committee to say, hey, please get involved. Um, please come to the meetings. Please help us talk about what community safety means to you. Uh, there is an on Right now, we only track community safety based on crime stats. Um, there is an, uh, a major major movement that says that community safety or safety is not the absence of crime, but it's the presence of well-being and looking at perhaps how do we measure well-being measures um, as part of our safety conversation. So um, if you have any groups or other committees that are very interested in this topic, we really encourage them to participate at the upcoming CCPAB meetings. Um, there's going to be a series of where we're discussing it and then bringing forward ideas. So um, just anyone who's interested in that topic can email the CCPAB. Um, it's SAC County CCP Advisory Board at SACCounty.gov, uh, or they can come to our meetings and help provide input into that process. Great. Thank you. Member Kathari. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to use this opportunity to lift up some of the work that the county's been doing around DEI, and our DEI equity officer is now, our chief equity officer is now in place. Um, we also have racial and health equity working groups, so I just want to make sure that whatever work is happening here uh, that you're helping to or we're helping to connect the dots on so that these uh, efforts don't uh, get siloed. But Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Member Lester. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, had a question. So over the last few years, a lot of elected bodies have come up with their definitions of public safety. I know for the city of Sacramento, speaking for herself, we have a very robust definition of public safety. So as the committee is working on that, and since it will be a guiding, um, probably a guiding document, has the county um, itself, the Board of Supervisors, defined um, what public safety is to them? And if they have, would that automatically be adopted? Or would this definition that the committee comes up with potentially be different? And is that how do we deconflict that? Great question. I don't believe that we have a set county definition. We do, of course, have the Public Safety and Justice Agency. There are certain implications that go with that office and what public safety and justice means. But in terms of looking at the, the phrase community safety, it's it's thrown around a lot, but it's never been defined, um, to my knowledge, within this county. Um, that said, the resulting definition that's produced from this um, ultimately what this board approves, <laughs> is going to be specific to this plan um, and our planning efforts here. We would, of course, encourage others to use it, but because it would be designed for the purpose of looking at the AB 109 plan, um, that's what it would be used for primarily. 
Great. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Thank you. Uh, I have a comment. I guess I'm trying to formulate my own thoughts. Um, similarly, I think curious, you know, how we'll reconcile what could be just a, a myriad of uh, thoughts, ideas, and opinions about what safety means. And um, I think there's maybe just a, a question about how far and wide the outreach will be uh, relative to that work. Um, certainly, um, you know, believe and have a lot of faith in what the advisory board will be doing, but also know that, you know, it's perhaps just a limited number of people. Uh, and then when we, you know, as a body are talking about, you know, a little over a million and a half uh, residents of the county, it just uh, something to be, be mindful of, I guess, is my, my comment. Thank you. Yeah, if if the uh, CCP has any ideas for us, we are open. The CCPAB is open to it. Um, you know, there have been some ideas talk about like maybe doing a, a single day workshop that asks advisory boards and commissions from around the county to come forward and hey, let's do a community safety exercise. What does it mean to you? Um, so there's been a lot of ideas thrown out like that, um, but we also recognize that. Uh, we do have to hopefully get to a definition this year so that we can continue measuring that. The alternative is to say that we need to come up with a different goal. Um, so those are kind of the two paths that could come out of this work. Um, but we would love any input that can help us uh, attract as much attention, uh, get as many people together, and really make this a positive exercise where, where people can, one, get to know each other, and two, um, help work together for a common goal, which is to look at, understand that community safety is important to all of us, but it means different things to each of us as well. True. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, still with you, Chief Lester? Yeah. Um, I just want to echo um, Marlon's comments. And you do a great job, by the way. Thank you for being like so knowledgeable about these items and being able to explain them so well. I just want to say thank you. I, but I do think it's important because it ties directly into funding. How you define community safety is really where you're putting your values. And when you put your values is where you put the dollars. And so, you know, especially as you're talking about realignment funds, I think it's really important uh, to do that. So just to kind of reiterate that piece, um, it's not just a definition, but it really is a value statement and how you're going to fund different programs. So Thank you for the work on it. Thank you. And uh, Member Jones. Thanks. Dovetails, doves, dovetails right into what Chief Lester just said. So just for uh, clarification for me, too, statutorily, we have to come up with a definition of, as the CCP. I want to then I have a couple other follow-up questions. No. There's okay. no requirement for us to come up with this. Okay. It was mostly recognizing we have this as a goal. We said, hey, we need to improve and maintain community safety. How do we measure that? Well, if we don't know what we all say community safety is, then measuring that becomes a lot more difficult. So it's, more, it's truly just for the benefit of this group and, um, again, continuing to improve this plan. Great. And then the CCPAB and other community outreach will be input and feedback, but this group will be the ones that come up with that. And it could be, more, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a concrete definition. It could be a set of shared values as well, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's ultimately whatever gets us to having objectives that we can measure yeah. uh, and outcome measures that we can agree on, that these are things that say um, we are either achieving or improving safety or we're not improving safety. So that's, that's the ultimate goal of why we would have this definition in the first place. But yes, it would be a specific definition approved by this body um, and as in the current direction, specific for this plan. Thanks. All excellent questions. Thank you. Any other comments from our members? Seeing none, uh, do we have any public comment, clerk? We have no public right. comment. Just like strike four, I believe. All right. Uh, if... That is the case, and there's no further uh, interest in the item. Let's please move, or actually, sorry, we do need to take action on this item before I forget. So we do need a uh, motion to approve if there are no other questions or concerns regarding the work plan. I will seek a motion. Motion to approve. We have a first. I'll second. And we have a second. We have member Walker with a first. Chief Lester at the second. Are you ready for a voice vote? Roll call. Member Benson? Yes. Member Donnelly? Yes. Member Cathari? Yes. Member Lester? Yes. Member Jones? Yes. Member Triplett? Yes. Member Walker? Yes. And Chair Yarber? Yes. And the motion carries with those members present. Great. Thank you all. All right, moving right along. Uh, 
Item five, clerk, would you please read it into the record for us? Item five is Community Corrections Partnership Advisory Board update. Thank you, and Laura, are you prepared to uh, I provide am. the update? Thank this you. will be extremely short and sweet today <laughs> because we've covered a lot of what the advisory Correct. board's been doing over the last couple items. Um, so as we mentioned, we drafted the work plan that you have approved today. Um, we um, formed those two ad hoc committees that we mentioned. We've met in total three times since the last meeting of the CCP. Um, we had a presentation from the uh, on-track program resources who did the community health and justice project and developed a blueprint, and that's related to the racial disparities work um, that is also on going with the CCPAB, and we've started some conversations about looking at what does a SMART goal mean and what is a SMART objective, and trying to better understand that conceptually and some of the things that are important to our members when it comes to um, reducing recidivism and returns to custody, as well as reducing use of jail housing. So those were the preliminary conversations that have been had so far, and as was already mentioned, we are going to be going headfirst into the community safety concept um, moving forward, so encouraging members of the public to get involved. And and um, also, uh, it was already mentioned that there, this was discussed at the Public Safety and Justice Agency Advisory Committee. So I think that's all that I have for you on this item. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Any public comment? We have no public comment. Public comment. All right. Uh, let's move right along. Item number six. Clerk, would you please read it into the record for us? Item number six is public comments, not on agenda items, and we currently have no public comments. Excellent. Any closing comments by the members? All right. If none, I believe we're adjourned for today. Thank you all.